Hi, and welcome to the Lens Rentals Podcast, where we talk about images and the people who make them. I'm Roger Sakala, the founder of LensRentals.com. Good morning, I'm Roger Sakala. Welcome to the Lens Rentals Podcast. I'm joined today by two people who know more about their stuff than I do, so this will be fun for me. I'm going to learn some things. Joey Miller is here. He is our head technician of troubleshooting and also assesses all the damaged equipment that comes back. So he's got a lot of knowledge about used equipment in general. I know how things break. You do indeed. <laughs> and Connie Canabat uh, runs our used sales arm. So a lot of Lens Rentals equipment that survives rental and that we think is good enough to sell goes through her and is then resold as used. So she's got a lot of experience on selling used equipment and therefore buying used equipment. She knows what sells well and what comes back because it doesn't stick. So we're going to talk today about how you can save some money buying used and bargain lenses and how you can save some money by not buying used and bargain lenses. (laughs) Because for every person who gets a great deal, there seems to be a person who feels totally ripped off. And uh, today I think we've got a lot of ground to cover, so we're going to get right to it. I'm going to start with how do you not buy a used lens because I this is the path that I see a lot of people go down and just feel ripped off or used. So, Joey, what do you got first? Um, don't think that magic bargains exist everywhere. Like, that's that's the main thing. Uh, a uh, used gear, you know, it's it's – it's used, so expect it to be like you don't go to a go to buy a used car and thinking it's like a brand new car. Like that's just not the way right. it works. Right, so. but you can get a really good used car. You can get a good used car if it's gently used, low miles. Like, and there there are ways to find used gear the same way. Right, so. and I think the magical part too is is you got to look. Are your expectations reasonable for used gear? Right, because if you're going to peer into it with a bright light and look for dust, it will be there. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> if you're going to examine the covering of it and look for a scratch, it will be there. If you're going to look and see if the box is dented, it's probably going to be. Yep. And if those things are not okay with you, you probably don't want to buy used. Right. Absolutely. <laughs> Connie, give me another give me another thing that uh, you see people get burnt on with used equipment. Basically, anything that a lot of people tend to have in their head that is super important, but tends to really not be. I, I think for me, one thing I'll look for is, have you got a scratched lens? Oh, yeah. <laughs> because I know the price is going to be much lower, oh, yeah. and it's going to work just fine for my mm-hmm. purposes. Um, uh, one other thing that I think needs mention is um, somebody somewhere, Joe Schmo, has a $300 lens, and it's just as good as somebody else's $1,800 lens, and therefore I'm going to get a $300 lens that's going to be that good too. <laughs> Law of averages says mm. no. <laughs> yeah. and, and I think if you're going to go down that path of I'm going to shoot copy after copy till I get a good one, your time is not very valuable. Oh, no. No, no, no. I'm on my sixth copy, and none of them are what I expected, and it's right. because the sample variation on that $300 lens is going to be high. Absolutely. Uh, and, and then one other thing that I, I do think is important is try not to read copy, advertising copy. Oh, it's all it's all bullshit. It's all bullshit. It's yeah. all hype. Now, that would be 100%, Joey. Is it 100% bullshit? Uh, it's 1,000%. <laughs> <laughs> Connie, you have anything to add to that? No. <laughs> yeah, that, that's uh, You know, if, if you've ever been around the uh, – the manufacturers, or at least the the U.S. offices, or whatever. It's interesting to see who writes copy. They're not photographers. No, you know, they never are. And then you you get these these dreamy you know uh, Shakespearean soliloquies about <laughs> uh, improving your self esteem via lens, and it just uh, it isn't there. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about things that you can do to find good bargains. Connie, you deal with people every day looking for a good bargain. So tell me some things that you think are are good things that people should consider. Well, one of the big obvious ones that I'm assuming Joey will probably back me on this is um, not going for that super high-end L-series or basically the the big lens that everybody is shooting with. If you go for that, you know, either a prime that's cheaper or a mid-range by a third party that's a, a lot of times they're phenomenal lenses, 
especially nowadays. I mean, Sigma's mm-hmm. putting out phenomenal options that mm-hmm. are very comparable to Pro Series lenses, Some and they're out so there are much awesome cheaper. Too. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I mean, you know, if you're going for the 2.8 zooms or the 1.4 primes, those are in high demand, and, you know, it's simple economics, higher demand, mm-hmm. higher price. Absolutely. Um, but, there, are like, you know, like you said, there are tons of bargains out there. If you don't need 1.4, like, say you want 1.8. Right. There's tons of 1.8 primes that on the used market are even cheaper. Mm-hmm. Um, like the Nikon 35 and 85 1.8s are excellent. I use them for weddings all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, the Tamron 35 1.8 is one of the sharpest things we've ever seen. And those are dirt cheap. Mm-hmm. Super cheap. Um, even Sigma's come out with a couple of uh, – well, if you want the 1.4s, Sigma's is the best way to go because they're all cheaper than the, the Canon and Nikon brands. Sometimes the mm-hmm. size is an issue. Yeah. And, and again, it, that's where you do your research think, because yeah. – right. Connie, have you seen people send things back going, I didn't realize it was so huge? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, we've That's got a lot said. of people. <laughs> <laughs> Did I set that up? <laughs> absolutely. Uh, yeah. So uh, we, that's probably one of our biggest returns is expectation of a lens, not really doing the research to understand size, compatibility with their own equipment, different things like that. I've definitely had keep people call in and ask me, like, can you go measure this lens yeah. and like, <laughs> send me like a ruler measurement? Like, yeah, that's fine. Or you could look it up on the internet. I was going to say, exactly. it's on the internet. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And then I usually try and give them like a comparison item, like, oh, it's like the size of like three Pepsi cans stacked or something, you know? Yeah. But I think that, that will you measure it for me? I, my first thought is always, do they think it shrunk? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's like every every place you go has got those dimensions out there. But no, I think that's real important. I'm a my own experience was I was shooting high quality f two eight zooms, and somebody gave me a one eight prime, and I was just blown away by it. It was better. Oh, yeah. It was just mm-hmm. definitely better. And I think people don't realize what a big step up that can be. An F1.8 prime stopped down to F2.8 is often the sharpest lens you can buy. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Plus, you've got that uh, stop and a third of headroom that yeah. you need. It, so. <laughs> right. And, and then the number of people, this is my favorite thing, the number of people who own a 7200 F2.8 that they use as a 200 F2.8, it just boggles my, oh my mind. God. And carrying that big, huge thing around all day, and it's really a prime to them. They've never shot it at another focal length. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right, let's talk about uh, third-party lenses because that's a big, broad group. Um, it's uh, filled with companies we've never heard of who are making the best lens ever for $55. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's also filled with some really reputable companies who are making really good bargain lenses. So, Joey, you mentioned Sigma, and I mentioned Tamron. M- most of their lenses are, are pretty good. Connie, anything else you want to throw out there that you really like? Takina is a great one. Ah, yeah, they make some good lenses, mm-hmm. too. They actually make some really decent zooms, and yeah. they're very, very popular. So getting those at a good deal is actually a little on the hard side because people know people they're know great. People know the secrets. Yeah. Well, give me some names of lenses that you find that are good bargains that you think are often found at good prices and are excellent lenses. Uh, definitely both the Tamron 35.14 and 1.8. Those are both great. Mm-hmm. Um, and that 35.14, I don't know if you can find use very often yet. Yeah, not really. And the 45 is nice, too. Mm-hmm. It is. It's a good lens. Connie? Uh, well, depending on your use, you know, the F4 versions of zoom lenses, like the Canon 24 to 70 F4, um, the oh, – what's the Takina with the F4? Uh, oh, the um, – Is it the 11 to 16? That one's a 2.8, right? That's a 2.8, yeah. yeah. Is um, it, so 12 to 20? 12 to 24. 12 to, yeah. yeah. That's, yeah. It. Yeah, that's a good lens. I like that better than – the 11 to 16 is not one of my favorite Like, it's lenses. old, but it's still great. Yeah, mm-hmm. I still recommend. Oh, the, six, the eleven to twenty is the newer version of that. 11 okay, to eleven to twenty. Okay, yeah. I like the uh, if you can find them. And again, they're they're not a lot of used ones. The Sigma twenty eight and forty arts are Those among are the so best yeah. primes I've seen. Yeah. Big they're lenses so though, good. you don't buy it yeah. if you're not ready to carry right. it. I mean, for me, forty is my fa- my favorite focal yeah. length. So, and most people don't realize the Sigma twenty eight is actually sm- one of the smallest of the Sigma primes. It's yeah. really not large. Right. Um. One other thing I think we need to touch on, though, is when you buy these third-party lenses, you're buying used. You have to consider you may need to get it serviced. S- depending on where you are geographically, that can be an issue. Now, in the U.S., I think there's some generalities, but I don't want to apply them to other countries. But we know Sigma's got good service in the U.S. Tamron seems mm-hmm. to also. Connie, you have to do a lot of sen- sending back and forth to service for touch-ups. 
Um, well, I can tell you the big one that's really, really hard to work with and basically non-existent is Nikon, um, which is why we unfortunately have a hard time moving them, but mm -hmm. um, they're very hard to work with. Canon is great to work with. Um, yeah, Sigma is great to work with. I yeah. think Micro Four Thirds is often difficult too, aren't they? Mm -hmm. Oh, especially if they can be. Boy, Boy, Landers, Landers, doesn't yeah. even have, you can't fix it. You can't get a part for Like is hard to work with just because of the international traveling. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we used to have, I don't know, it's still six months. It used to be six months turnaround. With Leica? Leica. Yeah. But the good thing is a lot of Leica service is now free. Ah, okay. So there's a good positive um, point. They, they started doing that. Um, we found that out recently. Uh, we had something come back. I can't remember what it was. Maybe a 75 Noctilux or something that a dude just destroyed. And we sent it in, and they repaired it free. Wow. That's pretty it's nice. It's like part of their marketing now is just to <laughs> well, offer free repairs on digital bodies and, and new lenses. I think one other thing to talk about, just kind of to summarize these, is, is don't get hooked in a brand thing. Like, this brand's all mm -hmm. good. This brand's all bad. Every brand's got some real dogs. Uh, every oh, brand. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Every Absolutely. brand. Yeah. And every – well, not every brand. <laughs> Most brands have some really good lenses. <laughs> <laughs> so – kind of that was good over you you know what are you looking for what are you looking to avoid but where you buy is the next step and there's a lot of options out there joey you've probably bought on every option there is every single one including us yeah I've even so, bought from us um, what do you think if you're buying online the most reputable places are places that are also like known quantities like keh is great uh adorama and bnh used are also great um us we're great uh, yeah, we have we have used cells on. If you don't I mean, yeah. in addition, you know, to, to, besides just working here, like we inspect everything so many times all the time. So uh, at least you know what you're getting, and we can like look up a history for you and everything. Um, and I think with all of those places as you mentioned, if you buy it and you open it up, you don't like it, you send it back and they refund right. you. There's exactly. Some, like those have they have return policies. You pay a little bit more for that, but that's a nice policy to have. You do. Right. Uh, where it gets real dicey is eBay. And Facebook Marketplace and Craigslist, I have bought from all of them, and I have regretted them. But I've also found some really cheap deals right. that did turn out well. Would you would you call that a dice roll? You're either going to get oh, a yeah. little cheaper or you're going to spend a lot more and probably even south. Yeah, and the around. odds are definitely stacked against you. Yeah. Like, well. definitely. Um, now, I will say eBay actually offers buyers and sellers a lot more protection these days. So Yeah. And you've got – a return window to deal with and everything so it's it's like this happy little medium between craigslist facebook whatnot yeah especially if you're going through yeah, paypal yeah so, absolutely yeah. paypal's a great option yeah, yeah, the, the, the meetup part of craigslist can get a little scary too yeah um, uh, i've definitely bought stuff out of the trunk of somebody's car from <laughs> craigslist uh in a dark you're parking a lot at soul. night like mm -hmm. <laughs> But, you know, I got that I got this really nice Bogan heavy-duty tripod for 50 bucks, so whatever. Well, and I, I will point out, because this is not widely known, I know people who bought stuff on Craigslist that they know was stolen when they bought it. And, oh, yeah. You know, they pretend they don't know, and the guy selling it pretends it's not, and everybody does that. If the original owner ever shows up, he gets it back, and you don't yeah. get reimbursed. That's right. And I say that because we have done that with some stolen cameras where they've shown up because somebody started using them. We've gone and gotten them, and sorry, mm -hmm. shouldn't have bought it that way because it was ours. And as long as we got proof of ownership, you lose it. So Yeah, we recently just found one of our lenses on eBay. Yeah. Uh, but uh, basically, if somebody bought that lens on eBay, we could go to their house with a police officer and take it back. Yep. Okay. Well, going on the buying used lenses things, uh, the other place I found bargains is the Version 2 or 3 came out, and the version 1 was really pretty good. <laughs> oh, yeah. 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 I can't tell you the number of people who sold their Canon 7200-28 IS Mark II because the IS Mark III came out, <laughs> <laughs> consisting of a new paint job. <laughs> oh, sucker's born every minute. Yeah. And, uh, apologies to any of you who actually bought that. I'm sorry. Well, it's a good lens, <laughs> and if I was buying one, I'd buy it, but... You know, I would like sell my IS2 for the IS3, but people did, and there were IS2s that weren't that old that could be mm -hmm. bought for a song. Well, and then mm -hmm. the market was saturated, and the price dropped, dropped on yeah. drastically. Yeah, mm -hmm. so there were there were some great bargains there, and you've got the same lens. You get some spray paint, you can pretty much <laughs> catch right up. Uh, one of the, not quite the same, but when Nikon came out with a new 24 
The old one was really good too. Yeah, it was the new one had some advantages and some disadvantages. So there was some bargains to be made. Mm-hmm. There's that group of people that are going to buy the new one every time. Mm-hmm. Every time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mentioned it earlier, but I go out looking for new stuff. I want. <laughs> Connie's gotten emails from me. You got any really beat up X, Y, or Z? <laughs> <laughs> because that's where I mean. You can get it for half the used price of a good-looking one. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Yep. Mm-hmm. So what what stuff do you look for that I like this kind of defect because the price has dropped and it's still great? One of my favorite, and that I, I realize a lot of people will probably think I'm crazy here, but are glass scratches. Mm-hmm. 99% of the time, they don't impact images. Um, if you're buying from a good company, then they're going to map it and tell you where it, it flares so you can – decide whether or not it's going to ever impact your images. Most of the time it's not because it's only flares at F8 or 11. And Especially if you use mm-hmm. hoods, it's probably yeah. not going to flare ever. And, yeah. and that's the big, you get that F14 prime that's used going for eleven, twelve hundred dollars with a front scratch that's now $800 yeah. and you're going to shoot it wide open, you're never yeah. going to notice it. And there's mm-hmm. so many people that just run away. As soon as they see glass scratch, they run away. So those, those products tend to sit and price just keeps dropping so they they're always a great buy yeah my, my personal collection is largely grass glass scratched so oh, yeah. <laughs> the other part of it is kind of like buying the used car if i get that lens and i buy it with a scratched front element it's not going to drop anymore no <laughs> that's the thing that i might sell in two years for what i paid for yep mm-hmm. yep especially as companies raise their prices on everything else as we go i did that with a i had a nikon 2470 i bought it for sixteen hundred dollars and Four years later, I sold it for sixteen hundred dollars. Right, <laughs> it's a good, good rental fee there. <laughs> what else? What else do you see, Connie? That that you would jump on? Dings. I mean, there's there's all sorts of cosmetic damage that isn't relevant to anything. You know, a, a ding in the filter ring, a cracked index scale. Those are things that people automatically see and assume there was major impact that caused that, but that's just not the case. I mean, the the outside barrels of the majority of these lenses are pretty easy. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, just because you read that on there doesn't mean that there's actual impact Mm -hmm. image, and it's a great buy. I think uh, we'll talk about it a little bit later as to what to be aware of, but I'm going to differentiate a scratch, a scrape, and a dent. Oh, yeah. Mm. Dents can be fine, but if you buy a lens with a dent in it, you want to check out the mechanicals yeah. and opticals really good because some of those look like they still work fine, but they've been optically jarred mm-hmm. or there's now a catch in the zoom ring. Mm-hmm. So uh, scraped or scratched, I don't care about. The dent, I don't mind as long as everything else is okay, but I check that one a little yeah. more thoroughly. It yeah. depends on the lens. Definitely. Like For me, uh, a lot of what I buy is vintage stuff anyway. Well, yeah. So if it's like an old brass lens and it's got a ding in it, that's fine. Yeah. <laughs> that's totally fine. <laughs> it's not going anywhere. Exactly. Um, this is not where we're going to go this time because we're going to talk about buying used cameras later. But one of my great bargains out there for me, if a camera has an HDMI port that's been pulled off the board, mm. oh, yeah. mm-hmm. I don't use HDMI. I'm not a video guy. Yep. They're nearly worthless. You can buy them for half Ooh. price. <laughs> And I pull cards out and put the cards in my computer, so right. I don't care. Right. Uh, I don't do much in the way of monitored shooting. If you can find one of those, that's a great bargain. Yep. Yeah, absolutely, mm-hmm. absolutely. Uh, my other favorite is uh, dust. Yeah. People are like, oh, it's so dusty, it's going to just screw up my M&L. Oh, yeah, mm, no. Mm-mm. Yep. Nothing, no dust you've ever seen ever in your life inside a lens is probably ever going to show up. I, With very, very few <laughs> exceptions. We've probably carried 20,000 lenses for 12 years. I've seen not a dust, but a speck, one of which was a spider. I was going to say your spider lens. The spider did show up if you stopped it down and focused close. Yeah. Yeah. That's a spider. And it was what? A giant blob. It wasn't even. Yeah, you couldn't see it was yeah. spider, but you could see there was a black Something thing there. Something there, yeah. But, yeah, it's it, it, it can happen. But the rarity is amazing. I would say 90, 99% of every call I've gotten where someone says, there's dust in your lens and I'm seeing it in my images. 99% of them are, they're using a wide angle lens and their sensor is dirty. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Stop down. Time. Stop, Stop down. down. Yeah. So that, that's, uh, 
We're never going to fight that battle. I give up on that. But, yeah, I, I love me a dusty lens. Give me a dusty scratch lens and, mm-hmm. you know, pay me to take it off your hands. Absolutely. What about wheeling and dealing? Connie? <laughs> Do you ever get anybody wheeling and dealing? Oh, absolutely. Yes. <laughs> no, I don't. Um, yeah, we um, we we have a lot of people who you know just reach out because they they want to lowball everything. They want the best the best lens at the cheapest price. That is not a reasonable request. But um, but yeah, I mean, th- there's always the option to wheel and deal on some level. I mean, even if it's a tiny percent. You know. Well, I, I know you wheeled and dealed with me, me once, but I had the I had the fortuitous thing of knowing you had like eight in stock. And I was like, <laughs> give me a great price on a crappy one, and you did. And I suspect if somebody else had called and said, oh, yeah. you know. Yeah, we, we look at everything. I mean, quantity, how long the gear's been sitting, you know, if they're previous customers, we're always willing to help someone out. Yeah. I think I think that's a reason. You're not going to find that too much on, on eBay. No, you probably will on no. Craigslist, though. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess some eBay's you can put a bid in sometimes that way. Yeah, sometimes yeah. they'll have like or best offer and you make yeah. an offer. Right. I've, exactly. I've done that plenty of times. Okay, we're going to take a little break and hear some interesting stuff from people other than us for a minute. And then we're going to come back and talk about the bewares, the things to not do or to watch out for when you're buying used gear. Now, Lens Reynolds brings you a meditation moment. Close your eyes. Lean back and listen to my voice. You feel yourself getting sleepy. Relax. Drifting on a cloud. You love this podcast. You want to give this podcast a five-star rating. You want to write a positive review of it and even subscribe to it. You know that will bring you a feeling of joy and contentment. When I count to three, you will wake up refreshed and go straight to the review page. One, two, three. Okay, let's talk about things to be aware of because there are some things out there that everybody's kind of worried about. There's a lot of other things I don't hear anybody worried about, and I think they're bigger issues. So who wants to start? Uh, sure. Um. <laughs> the enthusiasm just <laughs> bubbles over. <laughs> Joey needs more coffee. Uh, going back to what I was saying about the, the, the known places like B&H and NRM and KH and, and us, um, in a lot of instances, you can purchase an additional warranty through them, mm-hmm. um, especially like refurbished units will often come with a, a manufacturer warranty if you're going that route. Check for available warranties. Yeah. Um, and, you know, uh, some of those companies have warranties that are just lifetime warranties. That's really rare. But yeah. some of them do. But sometimes that only applies to like U.S. copies, not right. market mm-hmm. copies. Right. So, you know, just – Again, do your research. If you can find places that do that, it's almost always worth the money because mm-hmm. um, usually those uh, those extended warranties are, are pennies on the dollar. So, yep. Well, and the reality is, I mean, even if the you find a great deal somewhere that doesn't offer a warranty, you can buy warranties from other places. Um, I think what is it? Square Trade offers warranties. Mm-hmm. You can buy them from B and H, Amazon, wherever. Uh, even eBay has some. Of yeah. That. It, you could just go online and buy a warranty, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. Uh, now, you, you, you link the customer up with that when we sell them something. Right, we do. Mm-hmm, we do. Um, and one of the things you do need to look at when you're looking at warranties is kind of reading those terms and conditions. You know, um, a lot of them are basically middlemen, you know, that you're not sending it to them and they're repairing it. You're sending it to them. They're a middleman. They send it off to a service center. So you're going to have gear out of pocket for a while. That's something you need to think about on the front end. I think we've usually seen the repairs are done well, but not mm-hmm. promptly. Right. Be. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Okay. I think our normal turnaround we hear from customers is like 60 to 90 days. Yeah. Well, nice. Connie, you, you have a big advantage, though, because we have a repair department. So yes. a lot of stuff yes. we give our, our warranty on and then they right. go to the other. And that gets repaired here. And we're fast. Yeah. <laughs> we're awesome. Unless we don't have parts. And then we're slow. <laughs> <laughs> And that's that's a real thing. Again, it goes back to we talked earlier. 
Some brands you can buy parts for. You can fix it yourself. We can mm-hmm. fix it. Your independent repair shop can fix it. Some brands, there are no parts, and they're not going to be able to mm-hmm. do a damn thing for you. Yeah, and when buying used gear, that's extra important because if it's too old, right. there won't be any parts out yeah. there. Yeah, and go over that, Joey, because basically it's five years after they stop production that yeah, they have that's to have right. parts. That's right, especially for the big houses like Canon and Icon. Um, you can sometimes find parts sitting in a bin on a shelf at like a third party place Mm like we've had that happen at midwest camera and things Mm -hmm. like that where they're like oh we actually do have that part it's right um but we actually do sometimes yeah we do that sometimes too but the thing that that really is when you talk used gear a given lens often breaks the same way Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so when you go thinking i'll buy another broken one and get parts from that it's probably broken the same way uh, I know for a while we had Canon 510s that were legacy. There were no parts. Every one of them got retired with a burned-out focus motor because there were no more focus motors, and you couldn't buy another one. Well, except for the one that was uh, shattered out. Front. Yeah. yeah, we had yeah. the one. That we had one. <laughs> out, of, out of like seven, we could buy, you right. use that motor. Right. And I think it burned out too. So. Oh, totally. <laughs> and that's a good point to think about. You know, Joey buys legacy lenses. They last 100 years. They're all mechanical. That's cool. You right. can take them apart, re-lube them. and. Right. Those were built to last. Yeah, but when you get electronics, electronics don't last forever, and when the parts aren't available, I had somebody the other day, they saw a great deal on a Canon 200mm f1.8. It's a great lens. But when the focus motor burns out, it's a great ashtray. There's just nothing you can do with it. You can maybe manual focus it. Maybe. Some of them you can. Some of them, some of them focus through the motor, so you may not. Right. Right. Um, <laughs> So that's just something to think about. Um, some legacy lenses, I, I know super telephotos tend to be in that thing because you can get a working good optically super telephoto lens for a couple of grand instead of 10 grand. As long as you understand, it's going to last as long as it lasts. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Um, one thing I've seen people do uh, and not do, to my surprise, is I see this on forums all the time because I'm kind of a forum warrior. And it's like, I bought this lens from, you know, Lens Guru God, and within 24 hours wanted to send it back. I didn't like it, and he won't take it back, and blah, blah, blah. It's a real simple thing to start an email trail going, I do want 24 hours right. to inspect it. Now, most places, like we give three days, I think, and I mm-hmm. think all this, you know, the, the, yeah. the brick and mortar places do. But the guy on the forum or the guy on eBay may or may not, and mm-hmm. you can always ask on the front end for a 24-hour inspection period. Mm-hmm. He may say, okay, but you send send it back at your shipping. That's a reasonable right. deal to do. Yeah, absolutely. Um, with Craigslist, you're going to pick up a lens. I, I, and this is a simple thing, too. Tell the person, I'm going to bring my camera. I want 30 minutes to check out the mm-hmm. lens with you in there before I complete the purchase. Because I've seen people show up and they're going like, no, now, which should be a red flag. Right. <laughs> Run away. May, may not. Yeah. But uh, it, I, those things are so simply done on the front end and leave an email trail Mm -hmm. rather than making assumptions. So I think that's always a good thing to be aware of, that you are going to get a chance to look at it and return it if you don't like it. Yeah, trust Mm -hmm. but verify. Yeah. Exactly, (laughs) you know. um, And, you know, half the time when when those arguments happen, it it is what's – well, if you had asked me, but you didn't, and Mm -hmm. that's Mm -hmm. always an issue. The other thing, if you're buying online from an individual – Actually, if you're buying online, I tend to take pictures of the box and open it and take pictures. Mm -hmm. It has happened where there seem to be very legitimate disagreements about how it was when it was sent and how it was when it arrived. That's a very valid point. That actually has happened to us multiple times where a customer has said, this came to me like this, and you get it back from the return. And it's very obvious that there was impact damage. And the odds of the exterior packaging having... Zero impact damage, but the product inside having impact damage are very, very low. Well, I will say the way we pack, that's true. Yes, yes. But I've seen lenses arrive in a box full of peanuts, and if well, you've yeah. ever done that, the lens settles to the bottom of the mm-hmm. box, and one side has no peanuts. So Or no right. packing material at all. Right. <laughs> we, so, yeah. I mean, know. this is purely anecdotal evidence, but I know in my experience, the sellers that are very easy to communicate with, volunteer information, mm-hmm tend to be the ones that pack better and tend to be the ones that actually have decent gear. Yeah. Yeah. And probably tend to be the ones that took pictures before they sent it so they can go, it's <laughs> different now. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Because they've probably also been burned. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah, I remember the one we saw, Connie, you were here. I don't think Joey was, that 
the the box came in with tire tracks across the top of it. Oh. <laughs> I remember that one. <laughs> and it was sent out as a twelve by twelve and came back as a twelve by six. None of us were surprised yeah. <laughs> that it was damaged. We've talked about old fully mechanical stuff, but that's not what people are buying now. No, no. they're not. So <laughs> more for me. <laughs> yeah, I know. But you, Supply goes up, <laughs> prices go down. I get cash in. <laughs> you, you know, one of these days you're going to go on my shelf and go, "He's gone now. I want those lenses." <laughs> I collect old lenses. That's what we're. You don't think for. that's been my plan from the beginning? I figured. <laughs> I, I don't use them. I look at them. Joey wants to use them, and he's not allowed to touch them. <laughs> okay, so we talked about getting repairable lenses. I think one thing to consider when you're buying uh, any lens is we talked earlier about the electronics that fail. A lens with IS units, electronic focusing, 14 different electronic things is not going to last as long as Joey's mechanical lens. It probably is not going to last as long as one that's just a plain old autofocus lens. Mm-hmm. And what about age? Do you, do you uh, have any rules of thumb on where you start going with lenses? You mentioned the Tamron 11 to 16, still in production. It was in production when we started lens rentals. Mm-hmm. So that lens, you might buy it and it'd be 12 years old. Does that worry you? Yeah. Okay. Uh, mostly because of the type of lens. Like that lens got. That particular lens got recommended by Philip Bloom, so everyone bought them and everyone was using them as like this huge workhorse. So if you find them, they're probably heavily used, especially a 12-year-old copy. Mm -hmm. So it's probably seen... Yeah, but I will say the whole age thing is kind of a slippery slope. I Mm -hmm. mean, you know, what you're talking Mm -hmm. about is probably more of a valid point to to ask about and to look into the whole concept of how much was this used because someone could have a product for five or six years and it sat on a shelf 90 percent of the time that's if it was one of my lenses that's probably true (laughs) (laughs) right well and if you know uh like if i were looking at a 10 year old zeiss lens versus a 10 year old rokinon lens Mm -hmm. both both manual focus both mechanic fully mechanical that broken on is shit. Yeah. And that Zeiss is probably great because That's a good point yeah. to make though, because construction quality differs a lot. Mm-hmm. Like I would trust that Zeiss to take a drop mm-hmm. here yeah. and there. And I would also trust the person that bought it spent so much on it, they probably kind of babied it. Yeah. That, that's a really good point. And you know, we see that too. Uh, for those of you who don't know, we rent our gear for two years and then it goes over to Connie and is sold. Depending on that lens, Connie may get all of them. Mm-hmm. Or she may get twenty percent of them because eighty percent have already failed, mm-hmm. and that's that's a real thing. Yeah, and that absolutely. that difference there's a subtle thing if you want to kind of check if if you we're not going to put this out as like a blog post or something, <laughs> but if you go to the lens rental site and you look at how much does it cost to lend, to rent this thing, and you raise your eyebrows and go that's really expensive for that thing. One of the examples I remember years ago we had several three hundred two eight lenses. One of them cost half as much as the other. They both rented for the same price. There's a reason for that. The mm-hmm. reason is we're not getting any money back on the cheaper one. It doesn't live that long. It has mm-hmm. more repairs. So when you see things that go, they don't have many and they're really pricey to rent, that may be because they just don't survive. Mm-hmm. And That's a red buying flag one. <laughs> Buying one, well, it's not likely to survive long either. That's still a good idea. I mean, some people... If I was a cinematographer and I needed a fixed focus length lens and I could get a Zine for four hundred bucks or a Zeiss for four thousand bucks, I'd buy the Zine and do the shoot and hope it lasted after that. And if sure. it didn't, that's okay. <laughs> it's um, a disposable. Yes, you, disposable you have to look lens. at, at what you're based getting. on the conditions you're shooting in. Right. You know, you know uh, if I was going to blowing about. sand in the desert, I'm mm-hmm. not going to take my yep. Zeiss. Exactly. <laughs> you know, <laughs> but. I, I think that's something that people have to be re- realistic. We're almost going full thing to the magical thinking. You can get that great bargain as long as you expect it to perform as it's likely to perform. Mm-hmm. Right. Another thing on the build quality with age, high-end lenses, like your Pro Series lenses, your 2.8 zooms, your high-end primes, those are built to last because mm-hmm. the people that are buying them are the pros that are using them day in, day mm-hmm. out. Um, so an older version of that I would trust a little more if it looked cosmetically good because that means that person probably didn't treat it like shit. Mm -hmm. And it's built better than the cheaper one or the cheaper version that may look pristine, but, you know, if it's the same age, 
I don't know what's going to hold up. Well, I think your point earlier was really good. The person who buys the $4,000 lens probably takes really good care of it. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, buying a used Mercedes, you tend to get a pretty good car. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that's really a worthwhile thing to consider. Um, all those things being said, I think we, we've talked about the fact that you can save on average a good amount. Connie, my guess is that buying a used lens, you're about 60% of new price. Is that a good rule of thumb? Um, it, it kind plus of or depends. minus 20, yeah, maybe. Yeah. Um, but yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and, and I think that, uh, for a lot of people, if you don't think about that, that means basically you can have three lenses versus two mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and really, really worthwhile. Um, I like the points we made earlier. There's some great bargains out there for next to nothing. And it's a great way to try Say if you're a Zoom shooter and you want to try a Prime, that 1A Prime is mm-hmm. really, really a good bargain. Yeah. I'm going to talk a little bit before we go about looking at that used lens you purchased. And we mm-hmm. obviously talked about the cosmetics and we don't care. But when you get a used lens in your hands, there's some basic things you should do. Even if you're not a lens tester, you need to take a couple of pictures because sometimes the optics are not up to snuff. Mm-hmm. There's almost no way you can take one lens and go, this is not as sharp or as sharp as it's supposed to be, unless you have a comparison. But you can certainly go the left side and the right side are different. Mm -hmm. That's not okay. Mm -hmm. That's a quick and easy test. I always tell people, make sure you do the manual zoom and focusing. And if it's there, aperture control, because sometimes people don't. They just autofocus. Lock and switch is a big one, too. Lock switch is a big thing. Yeah, those break in a lot of cases. Mm-hmm. And the other switches on the body, the AFMF mm-hmm. button. Um, when you're when you're testing those zoom and focus rings, though, make sure you're tilting the lens in oh, different yeah. directions because very sometimes they can shift. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, some lenses that are very smooth if it's pointed at the ceiling are not at all smooth right. if it's pointed horizontally. Mm-hmm. And well, that catch and focus or catch and zoom... Mm-hmm. That usually indicates damage. They should be smooth. The resistance should be similar mm-hmm. throughout the range. Right. If it's if it's like a, a real jam, it could just be a loose screw inside, but it could also be something broken. Right. Right. Well, if it's a loose screw inside and you're not capable of opening that lens up to fix it, exactly. it's going to the repair shop. So, yeah. <laughs> And it, I think usually it is. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's what we've seen a lot. It's a loose screw or a bent mm-hmm. cam or something to that effect. But if you feel that catch anywhere in the lens, with a couple of exceptions, there's a couple lenses that tend to catch – where zoom rings change, there's one Nikon. It may be the old 2470. Yeah, yeah. That caught it like 50-ish, 50-ish, 35-ish, yeah. like right at the. And tree. that's just the barrels are both turning at that one point. But uh, those are those are important things to look at. Mm-hmm. IS units, Joey. I, I always heard this. I bought this lens, and the IS sounds funny. You want to talk about that <laughs> a little bit? Uh, yeah. Um, older IS units are louder than newer IS units. That's just the way it is. But if you start to hear them like stuttering or clicking or any other way not making like kind of a smooth vibration sound they're probably failing Mm. they're probably going to just crap out on you yeah and looking through the viewfinder or on live view while the is is working yeah you shouldn't you may see a little bit of tiny jitter but you shouldn't see a jump or stick exactly but another thing to keep in mind is the different brands do vibration reduction differently. Right. So uh, a Tamron isn't going to look the same as a Canon. Or sound the same. Or sound the same. Right. Uh, same with the Sigma. Those Like those three will all look different. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I've had people call and be like, this doesn't stabilize like my Canon IS whatever. I'm like, yeah, no, that's that's, that's right. <laughs> yeah. That is correct. That's because <laughs> patents. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Anything else you can think of that people need to look at when they get a piece of equipment? Well, I think – Talking about, you know, exactly how to test is a good thing. Um, you know, shooting a brick wall is a great way to, you know, tell, exactly. you know, left from right side being, you know, different or. Not everybody has an ISO yeah. 12233 chart at home. Right. Brick walls are good. <laughs> and focal lengths. Mm-hmm. Don't just test at the 12 feet right. where your chart is. Take it outside. Take some shots. Right. And don't just check on both ends of the zoom. Check in the middle, too. Right. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. So that, that's and all the of full aperture stuff. range. Right. And, you know, uh, if you have a camera capable of it, try autofocus in live view first um, because that will give you more accurate. Like you don't have time to sit there and do an autofocus micro adjustment if you have like 30 minutes to check a lens out. Right. Do it in live view. That will eliminate your focus errors mostly uh, and give you a more accurate representation of what you're shooting. So. That's quick and easy. 
Um, one other thing on the, on the focus part, I always flip to autofocus and just focus on something near, focus on something far, focus on something near that fast mm-hmm. because you do want to hear the focus motor go through its mm-hmm. whole range. And you want to get an idea of how fast it moves. That's not a sign of damage. Some focus is slow. And if you're buying this lens to go sport shoot, that may not right. be enough for you. Mm-hmm. And sometimes uh, a lens that should be fast that is slowing down is a sign of it dying. Mm-hmm. Yes. Screechy autofocus, another thing to run away from. Run mm-hmm. away, run away. Very common in um, well, yeah, certain brands. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, in certain eras, there was there was a couple of years where you started to see them start to screech, and then they made some changes, and the mm-hmm. different ones are, you know, new ones are different. That's often fixable, um, but do you buy a used lens because you want to go get it fixed? No. 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 Unless the deal is so good, you right. can get it fixed okay. and still pay less. Yeah. That's true, and that, that does happen. Um, One last thing that I can think of is um, knowing whether or not it's typical for that uh, that lens to slip when it's pointed down. Um, there's a lot of lenses that we see that you everything tests absolutely normal, but if it's one that's supposed to not slip and it does, that's indicative of an issue. You're basically issue. when the lens is pointed at the right. zoom creep. Right, yeah. zoom, zoom creep, creep. Yeah. Um, yeah, a lot of people have complained about that on lenses that you know don't have any sort of lock. Like mm-hmm. they're just going to do that, right. and with age, they're going to get worse. Right. That's just something you should live with. But some lenses have zoom locks. Some lenses, some of the old, um, actually even some of the newer, uh, longer zooms, like the the Canon twenty three hundred and the older one hundred four hundred and Sony uh, FE one hundred four hundred, they have a friction lock. Uh, and a lot of people don't know how to use those. Mm-hmm. They don't know how they work. Uh, like on the Canons, it's a split ring. And so you hold the focus ring and you turn this friction ring separately. Anyone who hasn't used that doesn't know how to use it. That exactly. Is, that is so counterintuitive. Exactly. And we've had so many people call in, like even on rentals, like I can't get this zoom to zoom or it's it won't lock in place because they don't know how to do it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so try and familiarize yourself with that. There's tons of videos on YouTube about it. Uh, or, do call and ask. or call and ask. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, the assumptions are what always come back and bite you, yeah. um, and that's I see that constantly. But yeah, zoom, also, creep is a, zoom creep is a thing that people look for, uh, and it is most lenses just do it. Mm-hmm. Like it's not a it's not usually a problem. Yeah, uh, you know, a related thing is on extending barrel zooms when the barrel is extended. Some of those lenses have a little bit of jiggle, mm-hmm. a little bit, but if the barrel is loose, as in rattly, then you probably have a problem. Right, and by a little bit. Millimeter or two. Some of them are a little more, and it's a little disconcerting, but they're all like that. Yeah, yeah, that's very true. Um, And for more testing, I I wrote a blog post years ago. It's a little dated, but still very good. It's difficult to find. You have to Google how to test a lens. (laughs) (laughs) Oops. But it basically— We can can link it in the show notes. Yeah, we can link it in the show. It basically goes with some images into a a little more detail than this about how to really evaluate a lens and see if it's a good used lens Mm -hmm. or not. Anything else you guys want to throw out afterwards uh, other than we probably need to come back and talk about cameras one day? Yeah. Oh, um, a lot of people like to buy cinema lenses used because mm. a lot of them are super expensive. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's some, re- I guess, repair houses will buff out scratches in the oh, front elements. Uh, that is very true. That um, is a, such a good point. If if you see a front element with no coating at all, it's probably been buffed, and that is a very, very bad thing. Very yeah, bad thing. Uh, they, they get, you know, if you're talking about a $5,000 lens, it may drop a 1000 with a scratch, mm-hmm. and they will polish it out. They've now changed the curvature of the front element and removed the coating. We actually have seen this enough that we have a spectrometer because we can tell <laughs> if the coating's been buffed because the color cast of the lens will be different. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you can kind of see that. Most similar lenses, like all CP2, should have a similar color cast. If you suddenly see one that looks different, run away, run away. <laughs> yes, yes. I mean, you know, if, if, if you're polishing the front surface, you're changing the curvature, you've now altered the optical quality of the lens. Like, it's not going to be... And not for the better. No. Right. <laughs> no. Yeah. That's a real good point. Not, not applying to many people, but it's a big deal when no. it does apply. Yeah. No. And we've, we've t- sent back a couple of lenses that we've bought... Fresh, used, look perfect. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, no. Let's call it a wrap for today. Thank you both. I appreciate your time. Thanks, Thank Roger. You. Thanks for listening to the Lens Rentals podcast. If you have any questions or comments, let us know at podcast at lensrentals.com. Today's quote is from Rachel Morrison. Life is unpredictable, and I feel to some extent 
Lighting and cinematography should be a reflection of that.